Hey there! Let's learn about Unicode, what it is, how it works, and what a programming language being Unicode aware actually means. I'm going to assume you have just a little bit of programming knowledge. To start, let's talk about how data is stored. All data is stored as bits, zeros and ones, either in RAM or on disk. Whether it's a number like 26 or a character like the letter D, it all gets transformed into bits for storage. For numbers, it makes sense to transform 26 to the equivalent number in base 2, which gives us its binary representation for storage. But what about the letter D? What about a Chinese character like this one? What about the thumbs up emoji? The solution is a collectively agreed mapping between characters and numeric values. The most popular simplest one is known as ASCII, which is an acronym but nobody uses the full name. ASCII maps a set of basic Western characters to numbers between 0 and 127, which means it can support 128 different characters. When you want to convert a string like hello to ASCII, you look up the relevant value for each character, convert the value to binary, and concatenate them all together to get the storage-ready version. Each character becomes 8 bits, or 1 byte, of binary data. This is known as encoding the string. For decoding, you do everything in reverse. ASCII has a great property, which is that the number of characters is equal to the number of bytes, since each character is stored using exactly one byte. In some programming languages like C and C++, the string length function returns the number of bytes in the string, which is the same as the number of characters in the string, for ASCII. But what about all the other non-Western characters in the world? For example, the Chinese language uses over 10,000 characters, not to mention other writing systems like Arabic, Cyrillic, Devanagari, and more. After many twists and turns, committees, proposals, and iterations, the Unicode standard was created, which encompasses over 100,000 unique characters in over 100 languages. To handle the vast multitude of languages, along with complex things like accents, emoji, modifiers, and other strange characters, Unicode is a bit more complicated than ASCII. To properly discuss Unicode, we're going to tighten up our terminology so everything is clear. First, we're going to replace the word character, which can be ambiguous, with the word grapheme. A grapheme is a single unit of a human writing system, like D or ni. Think of them as what would go on a single Scrabble tile. Words are not graphemes because they can be broken down into letters. To express a grapheme in Unicode, one uses one or more code points, which combine together to represent a grapheme. For example, D and ni are both represented by a single code point, and here are their names and values. More complex graphemes like this one can be represented either by the single code point Latin small letter E with acute, or by the native E followed by the combining acute accent modifier, which modifies the previous code point by adding the accent. Notice that we haven't yet talked about the binary encoding of these graphemes yet. We've just talked about how to map a grapheme to one or more code points, each of which has a numeric value. Here are all the graphemes we've talked about, as well as a few more along with their corresponding code point names and values in Unicode. Once we have the list of code points, each with a numeric value, the next step is to figure out how to transform them to their binary representation, called encoding. Remember that ASCII has just a single encoding strategy, which is to take the ASCII value and convert it to the numeric representation in 8 bits or 1 byte. Unicode, on the other hand, actually has several encoding strategies, there's more than one because they each have their pros and cons. Let's look at one called UTF-32. UTF-32 takes each code point value and converts it to binary, which takes up 4 bytes, which is 32 bits, hence the name UTF-32. This is similar to ASCII, which maps the ASCII value to 1 byte, except it takes 4 times the space. Here's what a string looks like when encoded as UTF-32. For compactness, I've replaced the full binary representation with the equivalent hexadecimal representation. The pro of this encoding is that each code point is the same size in bytes, regardless of its value. For example, the first code point is always at byte index 0, the second at 4, the third at 8, etc. The con is that this encoding is somewhat wasteful. Look at the string hello world when encoded using ASCII and UTF-32. UTF-32 takes up 4 times more space, which is a big disadvantage. The problem is that both small values, which are more common, and large values, which are generally rarer, both take up 4 bytes. Let's look at a different scheme that aims to address this, called UTF-8. UTF-8 maps each code point to between 1 and 4 bytes. Code points with lower values map to 1 byte, which can save a lot of space. Larger values take anywhere from 2 to 4 bytes. Even better, 
simple Western graphemes like D and Z have exactly the same encoding in UTF-A and ASCII because their Unicode code point values are the same as their ASCII values and the UTF-8 encoding of very small code point values is the simple binary representation like ASCII. This is phenomenal for backwards compatibility because it means that old ASCII programs can read UTF-8 with simple characters without even knowing that it's UTF-8. The downside of UTF-8 is that code points have unequal sizes in bytes, which makes it harder to index into them. This has some impact on performance, but usually you don't need to worry about this. Broadly speaking, UTF-8 is the most adopted encoding strategy for Unicode. You might be wondering, if small code points use fewer bytes and Western graphemes like the English alphabet have low code point values, while other alphabets have much higher values, isn't that unfair for those other languages because it takes more bytes to store them? The answer is, yeah, it is. English is the predominant language in computing because of the US and UK's prominence in developing the first computers, and so English ended up taking prominence in ASCII and later Unicode. Because of that, it gets the smallest byte storage in UTF-8. For similar reasons, the majority of programming and markup languages are written in English, like HTML. Interestingly enough, because of this, the code for a web page written in Arabic might still be predominantly English because of all the markup. At the end of the day, all encoding strategies have trade-offs, so it's valuable to examine why this one favors English so much. And we saw that a solution that doesn't favor any writing system like UTF-32 wastes a lot of storage. Let's review what we've discussed so far. A grapheme is the human unit of writing, which maps to one or more code points in Unicode. Each code point is then encoded using one of a few encoding schemes. In UTF-8, one such encoding scheme one code point becomes anywhere from 1 to 4 bytes. The big takeaway from this is that Unicode data is much more complicated than ASCII data. In ASCII land, one grapheme is one byte. In Unicode, this is not the case both because some graphemes map to multiple code points, but also because some code points map to multiple bytes. If you try to read UTF-8 encoded data as ASCII, or UTF-8 encoded data as UTF-32, you'll get very strange or unreadable output, sometimes called mojibake. We can sum this up with the following rules of thumb. First, to translate a sequence of bytes into human-perceived graphemes, we must know the original encoding chosen. Second, in Unicode, a grapheme is not a code point and is not a byte. This is really important because in many languages, the string manipulation libraries only work with bytes. In ASCII, this is perfectly fine because graphemes correspond one-to-one -one with bytes, but in Unicode, this is not fine. Here's an example using Python 2's native string. The len function returns the number of bytes in the string, which is 4, rather than the number of graphemes or code points, which is 1. Additionally, if we try to index into the string, we get the individual UTF-8 bytes that make up the code point for the thumbs up emoji, which is not really useful. These functions are what's called Unicode unaware because they operate on the bytes and don't understand the meaning behind them. It's more likely that you want to index into the string by code point instead. To do that, you'd use the U specifier to make it a Unicode aware string, after which the len and index functions work as expected. Let's look at another example, which is the thumbs up emoji with the combining modifier code point for skin tone changes. This is one grapheme that maps to two code points. It should look like this, but my terminal can't actually render it correctly. When we use the native string, we get a length of 8 because the code points are high values and thus require 4 bytes each. When you use the Unicode aware functions, we get a length of 2, which is the number of code points. This is serious business because naively manipulating the bytes in a string can easily garble the contents. For example, let's look at an ellipsis function that truncates text if it's too long and adds dot dot dot. If you use Unicode unaware functions, you might overestimate the length of the string because it counts bytes, not code points. Secondly, you might slice the string in the middle of a code point, corrupting the string. If you use Unicode aware functions, you'll get a more accurate count, but it still won't handle combining modifiers and could slice in the middle of one. If you want to handle graphemes, the actual human perceived units, you'll probably need a special library that knows that the thumbs up plus skin tone modifier is really one grapheme. I encourage you to open your favorite programming language and experiment with its string functions to see how they treat complex graphemes like the thumbs up emoji with the combining skin tone modifier. We can sum this up by adding to our rules of thumb. Use Unicode unaware string functions only if you're confident that every grapheme is a byte, which is only the case for ASCII and UTF-8 
that only has ASCII characters in it. Use Unicode aware string functions to manipulate code points for more accurate string manipulation and length computation. And finally, use grapheme aware string functions to manipulate user perceived characters for maximum accuracy. For the last part of this video, let's stop by the code point page for the thumbs up emoji. Here's what it looks like. You can see its name, code point value, 0x1f44d, which is 128,077 in decimal, and its encoding and various encoding strategies like UTF-8, UTF-32, and UTF-16, which we didn't talk about. If you were confused by Unicode in the past, hopefully it makes more sense now. If you enjoyed this video, it helped me so much if you could share it with someone that you think might enjoy it too. Thanks a lot.